Okay, let's move on into modernism. Modernism. Why the, does modernism arise? Well, you, I mean, you've, you've spoken about it, but yeah, yeah. I, I think part of part of the um, what's very important a lesson that that I'm uh, the, uh, from the spiral that one of the things that I try to bring out of my book and, and try to add some some uh, original thinking on is how how do um, how does one move from one stage to another? Right? That's a common question asked in almost any discussion or presentation of integral thinking is how do you move from one stage to another? And I think that um, the answer is is that there are what we might call value vehicles. In other words, uh, vehicles that express higher truth, higher beauty, higher um, ideals of morality, uh, and that, that these expressions, whether they be in forms of art, um, whether they be in science or philosophy, whether they be in, in forms of spirituality, all of these vehicles are what physically transport people. But again, in order for them to receive the value, that, that the consciousness-raising uh, transportation of these value vehicles, if you will, um, they, need to, they need to be able to perceive the life conditions. In other words, these vehicles don't provide solutions unless there's the problems that they are designed to address or perceived in the first place. Right. So in order for someone to be ready to move to a higher stage, they have to, the, the, the only way that they can perceive the life conditions that are requisite for that stage is to have succeeded at the previous stage. Mm-hmm. Now, again, we can't be too absolutistic about this because, um, for example, if we, if we move up a, a stage here and say, how is it that, um, that, that someone can be, for example, green at 16? In other words, how is it that somebody can be postmodern in their consciousness, even though they haven't really moved through modernist consciousness very much in their life? But if their culture, if their parents, you know, if, if, if they grow up in a society where they've been able to assimilate modernism, they can therefore see the life conditions that the problems that modernism occurs, and they're ready to, uh, to move into these higher stages as a result of standing on the shoulders of their uh, ancestors, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so a lot, you know, it, I don't think that each person's consciousness has to go through every stage in a lock step way, um, but it's very difficult to be postmodern if you don't have any experience with modernist consciousness. It's sort of an ersatz uh, uh, postmodernism or sort of an imitation of postmodernism that's not postmodernism in its core value. Do individuals develop through all these stages? So if someone reaches a postmodern stage at 16, have they developed through all those previous stages, even though they might not have gone through all the dynamic tensions of the... Of, the, of each stage, maybe. Well, I think in most cases, yes, but I think we can point to cases where a person became um, postmodern at, you know, as an adolescent mm-hmm. because their parents were heavily modernist. So they didn't, they didn't, may not have had a period where they identified themselves as a modernist right, and they held right. modernist values. Right. But, but unless they came from a family that was modernist or you know, at least postmodern, because the grandparents are modernist, um, it's hard for them to sort of participate in a deep way. It's only, you can only get a superficial grasp. In order to really have the consciousness become, to make your own internal awareness more spacious, so to speak, mm-hmm. in order to really gain the location mm-hmm. that, that metabolizing these values at a deep level requires, um, you know, I think there needs to be sort of culturally and historically in your background um, these stages. Mm, okay. Of course, there can be exceptions. You know, I, again, these are not rigid laws, but I think that um, you know, it, it, is, it is important to see that societies definitely have to go through all these stages and that individuals generally have to do, and depending on the individual, more so or less so. Now, when we get to historical examples, we move from traditionalism to modernism. How does that occur? It occurs, at least in we look at the history of Europe, we can see that it occurs when there's just a, a blast of new truth. Right, the new truth about the discovery of the big picture of the external universe. That had the, the, the that what that did is it it basically shattered the reality frame of traditional consciousness, and um, and then when we get the Enlightenment philosophy, we we see the formation of a new reality frame, a new, more powerful, enlarged reality frame that's built upon the foundation of the rubble, if you will, of the deconstructed um, worldview of traditionalism. Now, of course, the structures of traditionalism are thoroughly functioning in you know, European society, but um, the vehicle that caused people to, that, that, that raised their consciousness, again, was in, in the Enlightenment, was new forms of truth, new forms of beauty, and new forms of goodness. And let me explain. The new truth 
was the cognitive vehicle of the new philosophy. That's what it was actually called at the time, the new philosophy. Mm. And it was radical, and it spread throughout Europe. And again, it was illegal, right? You know, like Spinoza had to flee, <laughs> becoming arrested as a heretic. Yeah. And uh, so. uh, but, but the new philosophy was an extremely powerful vehicle because it, it was a, a kind of a self-evident truth to those who were hungry for a new worldview. But not only do we have the new truth of the Enlightenment, we also had new beauty in the form of classical music, right? Mm -hmm. Classical music is a, is a direct expression. Uh, it sort of goes with the higher truths of modernism. And, and, for example, if you listen to Vivaldi's Four Seasons, which was written in 1723, mm -hmm. you, can, it, you can hear the energy. It's almost like you can mm – -hmm. the music sounds like people looking through telescopes and mm -hmm. discovering the wonders mm -hmm. of nature. Mm -hmm. um, and and mm -hmm. so the sound of it and the feeling of classical music is very much the feeling of, mm -hmm. of the philosophy. The mm -hmm. beauty and truth mirror each other. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, these – the beauty and truth of the Enlightenment – um, those vehicles lead to uh, new ideals of morality in the form of um, the rights of man, uh, democracy, liberty, equality, fraternity. Those are new forms of goodness, and those are extremely attractive. Right? Each one of these worldviews emerges in the crucible of politics, and yeah. politics becomes the showcase for the higher morality that is brought by the new stage. Mm. So these vehicles of value, it communicated through beauty, through truth, and through goodness, are what attract people and give them that sense of identity that makes a worldview a historically significant new stage, new location in consciousness, and a new turn on the spiral. Right. And why in Europe? Well, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that it's arguable because of uh, Christianity becoming successful. Uh, Christianity's emphasis on the individual was um, you know, was a prerequisite to um, the sort of the, uh, the the individuality of modernism, the, the recognition of, of the importance of the individual, and, and it was one of the things that allowed. It was a transcendent truth that transcended traditional consciousness. Right mm -hmm. in traditional consciousness, the individual is not important. But in, um, in modernist consciousness, the individual is at the center of everything. And Christianity had that honoring of the individual more so than other traditional religions. And uh, that was one of the key bits of truth that, that caused, um, caused further evolution. Now, again, we can't reduce it to any one factor. Um, you know, we, we, we could have a several-hour conversation about the causes yeah. of the Enlightenment, and, and many scholarly works have been written on it. But I think integral, the integral understanding of values – and the integral understanding of this sort of spiral dialectical structure um, gives us insight into how and why modernism emerged, you know, more so than any other way of seeing. And it also shows us what it's going to take to, uh, to for, for us to um, help and facilitate the, the forms of healthy and sustainable modernism um, to grow, uh, you know, around the rest of the world where um, the majority of the world is in a pre-modern um, stage of culture. Right. The names we most associate with modernism today would be really science and democracy. The names I kind of you think of immediately associated with that worldview. Who are the who are the people that would stand out to you when you, you, you list individuals in your book? Sure. Well, um, you know, certainly the founders of modernism include um, the scientists and philosophers of the 17th century, um, and you know, we, we can identify Galileo. I mean, Copernicus was more of a Renaissance figure, so like Francis Bacon. Right. But but we see uh, Galileo um, starting to begin the conflict, um, and then we see uh, um, Rene Descartes coming along and mm -hmm. providing a new reality frame, a new metaphysics mm -hmm. right. that drew a circle around the new place to stand. It, right. it actually it, it created the terra firma of the modernist worldview more thoroughly um, than merely the scientific discoveries had done. Right. So certainly Rene <clears throat> Descartes. Um, and then, of course, we have a host of Enlightenment philosophers, you know, Spinoza, Voltaire, Locke, uh, Montesquieu, um, Rousseau, you know, certainly these are well-known figures in history. Who today, who today would you, would you associate so strongly with that kind of consciousness? Um, well, certainly scientific figures like somebody like Carl Sagan, who's, who's an advocate mm -hmm. of the scientific worldview. Mm -hmm. But modernism today is so diffuse. Again, when it emerges in its early, its early form, it's, it's nice and compact. You know, we can talk about it in, in you know, its borders are, are well defined. Mm -hmm. um, but just like the modernist culture has come to, um, to be, you know, diverse and wide and encompassing all kinds of aspects of society, it's way beyond um, Enlightenment philosophy. But Enlightenment philosophy still underpins um, the values of modernism and still forms uh, you know, much of the, the, the substance of that worldview structure. Okay. 
Well, maybe let's let's continue on then. We, so we move from modernism to, into postmodernism, and what what causes that shift? Well, again, are, are, are these value vehicles? If mm-hmm. you'll uh, pardon the trite expression, <clears throat> um, we, we see where where modernism was most successful, right, in America and again in the Protestant countries of the Netherlands and Scandinavia and and Britain. Um, we see the emergence of the postmodern revolution in uh, in the 1960s, mm-hmm. and um, one of the things, one of the vehicles that really caused people to uh, to adopt the postmodern worldview, part of it were the life conditions of the dissatisfaction of modernism. In other words, modernism has, be- you know, it became as successful as everybody in America was middle class, and it was, I mean, not everybody, of course, but. Um, the middle class in America really came of age after World War II, right. and, and again, it's 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 cliche to talk about how uh, in the 50s, um, you know, America was was uh, successful, but it was very sort of bland, right? And um, mm-hmm. uh, and of course, this this idea that that the whole purpose of life was to achieve status and material. Once your parents already had status and material, once you were guaranteed status and material, you could see that status and material were not satisfactory. And so those those the discontents of of the of modernism that it's most successful are what made uh, the alternatives to modernism uh, visible. You know that as the life conditions created the need, which then the new values could fulfill and they and they could be perceived. And these new values came in the form of new musical forms. You know when Bob Dylan sang the times they are changing, um, he that Bowie wrote about him that he sat behind a million eyes and told them what they saw. People could feel uh, collectively that there was this a, a, a new truth and a new beauty being expressed in the music of these um, you know these '60s musicians and and uh, you know the fact that that music is still so potent today um, is evidence of the fact that it, you know its timelessness is is uh, is part of its uh, you know artistic value and its artistic value comes from its um, uh, cultural potency in causing evolution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so you see it, but, but of course, the '60s weren't just caused by music. It wasn't just beauty; it was also uh, new forms of goodness, right? The, the, the higher ideals of uh, equal rights and uh, peace in Vietnam. Um, these were political issues that were um, kind of showcases for this higher, more world-centric morality. You know, modernism has, uh, you know, some aspects of it are, are world-centric, some aspects of it are ethnocentric. Mm-hmm. But with postmodernism, world-centrism appears, um, you know, in, in stark contrast to the sort of the more Machiavellian realism that you see as the morality of modernism. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and so you see the emergence of postmodernism, and it, um, it it it's just a whole new way of seeing the world. It, it part of it is a harmonic return, you know, to a romantic period in the past, a kind of a, a, a skewed view of history, seeing it in, in more positive terms. But again, um, you know, which explains can, why many postmodern individuals might see have, have tend to romantic or, or have often tended to romanticize indigenous cultures and historical. Well, epoch. again, you can see a lot of p- parallels with um, with biology and with physics, just like in physics, right? When you have the musical notes, right? Those are laws of the universe, and you strike one note, and there, it produces harmonics above on the octave. Mm-hmm. Well. I think that when modernism first emerged, you can see a harmonic of, of postmodernism first appearing in the form of the Romantic movement. And although much of Romanticism in the 19th century was simply a regression to pre-modern, you know, levels, some of it was embodying, um, you know, like the uh, Emerson and, and uh, uh, Thoreau, uh, to the extent that they were, you know, maybe not strictly Romantics, but they were certainly influenced by that movement. And so part of it was an emergence beyond modernism, and part of it was a hearkening back to previous levels. And, and, and the best way to think about it is in terms of harmonics in music. Um, so we have postmodernism, you know, it, it emerges in, in forms of, of saints and sages, um, like uh, St. Francis of Assisi was a pre-modern embodiment of postmodernism in a way. And, of course, then we have Thoreau who, uh, and, and, and other figures like him, but Thoreau is a great example because if you read his work and you see it, it's, it's thoroughly postmodern. Mm-hmm. It's almost all the elements of postmodernism are there. Interesting. Um, and, and, but yet the cultural structures didn't exist, right? They were right. just as an individual. Right. In the 60s, you see 
beginning to emerge as a culture. And, um, and this was partially because of the new good, new goodness of the new political ideals of equality for different races, equality for women, and equality for really, you know, everybody in the world counts, not just Americans. You know, there's a thorough re- uh, rejection of ethnocentrism, nationalism, any kind of, uh, of uh, group belonging that is um, less than the entire, everybody in the planet, you know, and maybe even all sentient beings at the, at the highest level, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is definitely a new form of goodness, a new ideal of morality that that is is uh, that attracts people, especially those who who are at the cutting edge of culture at the time. The, you know, the, the sons and daughters of the middle class in America and in, in Western Europe were um, attracted to this because they could see that it was uh, it transcended the the becoming stale values of modernism. And uh, and of course, you know, there are many triumphs of postmodernism. Um, you know, in terms of its it, the progress that it's made in um, in, in uh, taking American culture and, and, and sensitizing it, and feminizing it, in scrubbing off a lot of the hard edges of modernism, a lot of the ethnocentrism, a lot of the problems of modernism. You know, we look back at '50s culture, we see how chauvinistic it was. We're, we're sort of our sensibilities are shocked because we've seen that's how far right. we've yeah. come um, in those ways, and, and that's been achieved through uh, the, the progress um, produced by postmodern values. Many things we take for granted, or, or in some sense a little bit take for granted today, it's amazing actually how much the culture has changed in certain particular ways in the last 40 years. You know? Right, but again, you know, postmodernism's problems are, you know, the next conversation, but, or, you know, the net, that, that's coming up, but let's right. talk about the positive aspects of postmodernism for a little bit longer. Clearly, um, it's the most evolved form of culture, you know, that has yet to appear, and, and um, you know, the postmodern worldview, it values not progress, but sustainability. It values not hierarchy, but inclusivity. It values alternative medicine, alternative spirituality, and personal growth. It values alternative politics, and it places increased value on the environment and all things natural. And these, of course, are, again, you know, in my estimate, significant evolution in consciousness, all those sure. values. Sure. And I mentioned earlier how each stage kind of um, gains an advantage on the stage that came before it and is able to, in a sense, defeat it. So we see traditionalism defeating warrior consciousness as a result of its higher levels of discipline and organization. Yes. We see modernism defeating traditional civilizations because of its technology, right, and, and general science. The mm-hmm. scientific military is, is you know, awesomely powerful. Mm-hmm. But we see postmodernism able to defeat in some ways, you know, not always, but, but one of the advantages that we can see clearly is this idea of nonviolent resistance. Mm-hmm. Right. In other words, the British Empire was effectively trumped by Gandhi's application of mm-hmm. Thoreau's mm-hmm. theory, mm-hmm. and it's it's by using the inherent morality of modernism and by shaming it into through nonviolent resistance and through, for example, Martin Luther King um, clearly uh, achieved postmodern goals of civil rights through nonviolent resistance that was this this world centric morality um, brought to bear in the struggle, and indeed it's triumphant. Now, of course, you need modernism in order for that to work, right? That's right. Nonviolent resistance requires it, it, a level of morality. If exactly. you're trying to be nonviolent resistant to warrior consciousness, they're just going to kill you. Exactly. <laughs> but if you've got modernism, and, and, you know, inherently the people are decent, or at least the majority of them are, you know, you always have the bad actors, but they'll eventually come around through that nonviolent resistance to see that indeed, um, you know, that, that, uh, that the, those who are resisting have the moral high ground. That's why they often say, if the, if the, well, I've heard people say if the Palestinians had done, uh, had pursued their goals through nonviolent resistance, they'd already have a state. Oh, by because, far, because definitely. Because enough modernist consciousness, the, the conclusion would be in Israel to, to achieve that. Of course, the Palestinians need postmodern consciousness to do that. Exactly. <laughs> That's the other issue. Yeah. Well, or they need a leader like Gandhi, and exactly. uh, perhaps the conditions will, you know, I mean, we certainly saw it with M- Mandela in South Africa. Yeah. So let's hope that uh, that we get somebody, a figure like that within the Palestinians. Right. But anyway, of course, um, uh, you know, postmodernism is a beautiful thing, but it also creates, like every stage in the spiral, its own problems. And uh, those problems, you know, the ability to see those problems are prerequisite to integral consciousness, at least, you know, largely prerequisite. So what are the problems? Well, um, the problems of postmodernism involve value relativism. That's one of it. In other words, um, you know, the problem with value relativism is that it seeks to honor and include everyone. Mm-hmm. It often becomes blind to comparative excellence. 
Mm-hmm. And examples of this anything goes inclusiveness of value relativism can be seen in many areas of progressive culture, such as New Age spirituality, alternative medicine, and some extreme forms of multiculturalism. You know, the, the postmodern worldview has done well in its identification and condemnation of uh, growing global problems such as environmental degradation and unfettered corporate globalization. Sure, but was... the proposed solutions to these problems often amount to a kind of an admonition that we all just need to come together and wake up to the fact that we're really all one people. And I think if it were possible for the world to come together like this, it would indeed provide many solutions. But this call for a great awakening uh, rings hollow because it's usually addressed to humanity as a whole without regard to the fact that the majority of the humanity is not yet able to make meaning in the way that the postmodernists implore. Uh, I think Wilbur has done an extremely you know, good job of identifying this. He sort of says something about how these, uh, the, these new paradigm advocates assert that we should all learn a world-centric ecology and a global compassion, but they don't have a clear idea of how consciousness can actually be raised to this level. Can, so it can, makes them kind of cheerleaders for a cause that has no realistic plan of actualization. Explain that. Well, in other words, um, if you look at the environmental movement, right, you know, it, it, there's this admonition that we should all uh, kind of care about the environment, which is straightforward and true. And, it, you know, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. But when the majority of the world is in a pre-modern state, um, they're much more concerned about feeding their children than about preserving the environment. You know, they're dealing with life conditions that are much more immediate and, and more um, a cause uh, more direct kinds of suffering that means that they, you know, that they can't, they're, they're not able to sort of grapple with or, or worry about problems that require higher stages of consciousness to even see. Right. And, uh, and so uh, if you expect the people in Brazil who are cutting down the rainforests to be shamed into simply behaving better, um, that's a pretty you know, naive uh, approach to the problem. I mean, the problem's real, that postmodernism identifies the fact that the rainforests are being cut down, and this spells doom for everyone, right? Yeah, yeah. But the solution is just to sort of assert that we should all care about the rainforests. And for some people, that's what's required. Indeed, within the postmodern worldview, asserting that um, is a, um, you know, the people, postmodernists get it, and they're, they're rallied by that. But in order for them to become effective beyond simply recruiting people to postmodernism, which is, is a good and worthy thing, which is ongoing, but it's not going to be enough. It's not going to be soon. You know, it's not going to be um, yeah. uh, sufficient to, to, to solve these problems because the problems right. are, are coming on faster than postmodernists are able to recruit to their worldview. Right. Right. So it's it's the it's the the life condition of the uh, postmodernism. One of the things that one of the life conditions that postmodernism creates that that is a prerequisite and an animating life condition for integralism is this recognition of the um, of, of the fact that postmodernism is identifying these problems, you know, and, and it's, it's 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 holding them up in stark relief. And it's absolutely true that these problems are very real and very threatening. You know, global warming, right. you know, all these things. Right. Um, but Postmodernism is largely impotent in its ability to take the sort of the, the global, political, cultural, social actions that are going to be required in this century if these problems are going to be uh, kept from causing significant regressions in you know the world civilization. Right. Um, just just to say because because that internal space we were talking earlier about the internal space. Uh, so the internal space of postmodernism would be you know it, heavily enlarged in the sense that in the sense that there's a there's a real world century because you're saying consciousness in the sense that one's own identification of self is connected to the whole world and to the whole species in a sense. Yeah. Um, and also one's able to 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 actually uh, because you spoke earlier about traditional consciousness from moving from warrior consciousness to traditional consciousness is movement from first person to second person. Well, I think that overstates it a little bit. I think we can see in tribal consciousness Mm -hmm. a kind of a limitation that comes from having more or less a first-person perspective. That doesn't mean that people in tribal consciousness can't recognize other people or whatever, but I mean, these are subtle things. You can't absolutize them. And I think we can see this in tribalism. I think warrior, you know, I don't don't want to um, make it too simple or too sort of lockstep. I think that, that clearly... First-person limitations can be seen in tribal consciousness, and we can clearly see the emergence of a clearer second-person perspective in traditional consciousness. Mm-hmm. I think that's about all we can say about that. Right. And, a clear, know, and a clearer than third-person perspective in, in modernness. In well, right, and, and I didn't talk about right. that, and that's yeah. beautiful in the sense that the third-person perspective enacts 
the viewpoint of the objective observer, mm-hmm. right? You know, mm-hmm. until you have that third-person perspective, you can't look at things objectively. Um, you know, what, what's been called the Cartesian enchanted circle of objectivism. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Descartes' philosophy makes it possible to see things from a third-person perspective, from a scientific perspective, from a, uh, a rational perspective that's not as thoroughly available to earlier stages. It's not that these stages can't use reason and logic, mm-hmm. but they don't use reason and logic to recognize the, the inherent myths of their own worldview. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it's only the thoroughly, thoroughly realized, re- clear-eyed perspective of rationalism that comes with the new epistemological capacity of modernism that brings the power of, of science. So, and, and, anyway, go on. so what's the epistemological capacity then of postmodernism? What, what, is that, what is the new perspective we're able to take then? I, I think it has to do with sensitivity. I think it has to do with compassion. I think it has to do with moving away from the individualistic orientation and the kind of the hard instrumentalism of modernism um, to a more uh, feminized worldview that is more um, that's more sensitive to the suffering of others. I think that you mm-hmm. can you can you, you can really s- put oneself in the is the cliche in the shoes of another, but to really be able to do that is no joke in terms of one's own capacity, in terms of one's own consciousness. Right. We can. Um, uh, we can see that, uh, that that there's a sort of a that you can feel the suffering of others from the postmodern consciousness that other people's mm-hmm. suffering you can't be callous to it it doesn't go unnoticed like it does within modernism right. you know within modernism it's about achievement it's about a hierarchy and those who've achieved that hierarchy you know certainly you know have a sense that we'd like to see everybody become successful to the extent that I've achieved mine um, you know I you know that, that that's because only because of hard work and my own inherent abilities or whatever right but with postmodern that won't stand anymore because everybody counts, and and if, if anybody's suffering, then we're all suffering, and that's a new capacity, and, and that leads to a sensitivity. It leads to a um, a more of a, a higher level of morality that only occurs when um, you know you care about others in that way that you're that you're connected to them in that way. Good. Right. You know, Gebser talks about uh, this, this what he calls a perspectival consciousness, and whether that is, is, is it can be attributed to postmodernism or integralism is a whole other discussion. But now, it's worth throwing that in there. Now that he by that he means sort of uh, which I sort of means almost no perspective, me, or means one is able to take the perspective of the whole in some sense, or to well, be able to see, grasp things as a know, whole. You know, any perspectivity is subject to different interpretations. I mean, I, you know, I think people who are hardcore Gebser scholars would be able to do much better in terms of, of, of what they would see as what he really meant by that. Um, the best way I know of, of, of explaining that is, is from um, a, a, a way of describing it that Robert Keegan, who's a prominent developmental psychologist, uh, has said. It's that it's the ability to recognize conflict as over-identification with one side of any system. And so when you begin to look at things dialectically, um, well, you know, I think this is what Wilbur calls vision logic, and, and this is the epistemological capacity of integral consciousness. I talk about it as... Uh, so, so now we're moving into... Yeah, the but integral. we should okay. probably, because yeah. I think we should probably save integral consciousness for, you know, the next next talk. No problem. Let's, let's just get a good place to end it, and we'll want to get a little deeper into that. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Carter. All right. Bye-bye.